You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hi everybody, welcome back. In episode number 11, Intense Conversations, I told you about my thoughts on conversation, on talking to people out there in the universe, out there in this world. Now, I personally believe that each one of us, as individuals, is an eye of the universe. We are all awarenesses made of the universe, and we're exploring the surface of our individual universes. So in this strange way, we are all fingers of the universe searching around and trying to figure out its own form. This is a common idea in many philosophies, and I happen to subscribe to it. Now, as a person, I want to understand the universe. I am a particularly curious and sensitive finger of the universe. And if you're also like this, it turns out the easiest way to figure out anything about the universe is to just ask it. Ask the other pieces of the universe that are all around you, other people. Other people are like a direct phone line to the universe. And if you talk to enough of them, you'll start figuring things out. So today, on the Higher Ideas Podcast, we will be calling the universe. So bear with me, this is quite a long phone number, as you might imagine. But I promise, this is going to be worth it. Alright, let me just speed it up here. And here we go. Universe Switchboard, how may I direct your call? Get me someone awesome. You got it, honey. Please hold. Hello? Hey. Hey, who is this? Oh, this is I. Hey, isn't this uh, my coworker? Hey, it's me, Irish, man. How you doing? Hey, Irish. How's it going? Not too bad. Well, I'm glad I got you today because uh, you're you're an artist like me, aren't you? Uh, I claim to be. Yeah, so I, do I. I claim to uh, believe that I am, yeah. Well, this is perfect timing because I was just looking for someone to ask, what is an artist? What is an artist to you? Wow. Uh, for me? How would you define... That's an artist. Uh, that's that's a that's a tough question. I, I think an artist for me is fundamentally a few things. Well, um, let's break into that. Okay. Well, um, I believe that uh, artists fundamentally are uh, beings who imitate life, and uh, you know, it's all about maybe taking what you experience in your life in in your own personal experience and communicating that back to the general public. It could even be to one person that you want as an audience or an entire population of people. And I believe fundamentally it's about that. It's imitating either an emotion or imitating something that you appreciate in the world. And uh, and also it's, it's about communication as well. Um, you know, not all of us are, are genius writers, so uh, I think... You know, we, we use our abilities to uh, put together something in color and, and, and light and dark tonal values and contrast and we say, hey, I'm going to tell you about this. And it could be represented in a picture or a sculpture or whatever. I, I believe that our role is, is really just uh, to be expressive hmm. visually. Yeah. So what do you think is different about a person who becomes an artist versus a person who just is, let's call it an average person, an everyday person? What's different in an artist as a person? I think inherently artists have a higher sense of appreciation for things that are beautiful or just things that are interesting. I think we, for some reason, tend not to take mundane things for granted. I think we're very analytical and there's something about there's something about our personal fascination with our surroundings and our experience in life that really 
uh, forces us to be more introspective and, and, and look at things objectively and look at things in an analytical way um, and, and just appreciate the beauty in that, you know. It could be down to the shape of something, the, the texture and surface quality of something, the colors, what they do for us. I think it's just about being more analytical. Mm. I think you're right that a lot of what makes a person an artist is an appreciation for beauty. I was just listening to a video this morning. Um, do you know Richard Feynman? No. He was an awesome scientist uh, in the same sort of vein as Carl Sagan. Oh, cool. I he love was a Carl physicist, Sagan. I believe. Yeah, Carl Sagan is awesome. But in that same era, there was Richard Feynman, and he left behind a whole host of recordings. And it's really fun listening to his uh, stuff. But this morning, I just watched a clip where he was talking about an artist friend of his who would say something along the lines of, I'm an artist, you're a scientist. Um, I appreciate the beauty of a flower more than you do because you see its pieces and you see its mechanics, right? And Richard Feynman sort of goes into an explanation of how that makes no sense to him because he feels that he appreciates it more than that artist because he understands so many levels of beauty there that the artist doesn't, right? The artist sees the flower and thinks it's beautiful, but in his breakdown of the cellular makeup of the flower, the the Fibonacci sequence that's in there, you know, all the machinery and mechanisms that make it work, he finds that he sees beauty deeper than the artist. So on that level, I would actually say that he's also an artist, right? Even though he didn't go into visual arts, even though he went into science, I think the pursuit of beauty and the sort of appreciation of beauty wherever you see it, even if it's not in the artistic industries, I think that also makes you an artist. I think that's an interesting point. Because uh, what you're what you're getting keen on is about um, uh, breaking things down and, and describing them, mm. and I think as artists, we have to be analytical about what we're trying to represent or what we're trying to express. We have to study references. We have to study what's around us, um, and I think depending on the artist, uh, you know, some artists might not go so deep in you know, describing or really trying to figure out what makes that flower unique or interesting. But some artists do. Some artists can get very scientific, you know. Mm. Um, I think there's that sense of wonder that we share with scientists. Um, scientists want to have everything explained um, right down to, you know, measurements and and uh, certain sequences of construction and and uh, uh, just understanding like the genomes of things and and the pathology of 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 of, of a flower. Where did it come from? What was this flower millions of years ago? Down the line, you know, um, I find that's that's a super deep pursuit of understanding for sure. Um, and I, what amazes me is that. Uh, I find that the scientific route is um, almost as spiritual as the artist's route. I think the artist's route is more about um, just processing and taking it for what it is and then processing that and re re-demonstrating what that means. You know, there's a certain definition that an artist has, uh, uh, emotional. Right. It's more emotional. Right. Whereas science, I think science is more descriptive and it's more defining. But at the same time, they're very similar. I mean, it's all about trying to figure out what makes up what's around us and why is that fascinating to us. I mean, I would never downplay what a scientist pursues because they have, they share the same sense of wonder that I think uh, any artist would as well, hmm. just in a different way. Uh, maybe not so much on an on a immediate emotional level, but, right. you know. And I, I wonder if in both cases, both the scientist and the artist are just trying to come to grips with reality, if they're both just trying to find a way to understand the world. Oh, absolutely. Right, like when, a, when, a, when an artist is trying to capture the essence of a flower in a painting, is he doing that to reproduce it and feel proud of himself for having done that? I, I tend to feel that it's more about trying to understand it by capturing it, right? In the same right. sense that scientists would try to understand it by dissecting it. 
So it seems to be the same urge applied in different directions. And yeah. it's, it's, almost, it's almost the same as when it comes to science versus religion, right? Religion is almost artistic in the sense that it tries to understand things at face value. It tries to weave a story around our reality and go through intu in, uh, go by intuition to explain what happens around us, where a scientist isn't satisfied by that. And they'll go digging deep into it, trying to find out the real true mechanics of it. Right. right. And I wonder if either of them would ever come to the full answer. And in the same sense, would the, would the artist ever be satisfied with his endeavor trying to understand the world through art? It, it seems to me that when it comes to these sort of extremes, when it comes to religion, when it comes to art, when it comes to science, you have these personalities that go all the way in these directions. Yeah. And I'm not sure that any of them will ever reach what they're looking for, right? And that's where you come to the conclusion where maybe the answer lies in between all of these and being a more balanced person that draws from all these pools you have a better chance of finding whatever it is you're looking for out there. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a lot of people like that out there. Yeah, um, totally. Uh, when it comes to science, for example, the, the greatest scientists, in my opinion, were half artists. Like yeah. Carl Sagan, he was half a poet, half an artist, and yeah. who knows how many other halves of other things. He was a very balanced human being. He was probably using both sides of his brain yeah. more often oh, yeah. than, you know, when you're extreme point. left or an extreme right. Yeah. You're literally, you know leaning and biasing towards those directions. Yeah. And, I mean, it, it's a physical reality, too, how your brain operates. There's, uh, there are people who are way more logical than people like like us who are artists, and, and we seem to bias more off of emotional responses to what we to what we get excited about or, or what we get fascinated about in life. But uh, there's something to definitely to be said for those that have that precious balance between, you know, exercising both sides of the brain, and I, I think that makes them well more, way more well-rounded and a lot more intelligent as well. Yeah. It's also strange how, at the same time, though, it can handicap you, because I know that when it comes to me, uh, I don't know if you were always an artist ever since you were born, basically, but when it comes to me, I was a scientist before anything else. Like, for really? the whole early part of my life, I was just trying to understand the world, and I clung to science. I, I liked, you know, astronomy yes. and, you know, dinosaurs all sorts of books about animals and nature and plants, and I always had my nose in a pile of dirt looking for an insect or observing a plant or just trying to figure out how everything works around me. And that was my obsession for a really large part of my youth. And then I guess around the age where um, you start getting emotional issues, where you start you know, hitting puberty and then girls come into the mix or you know, all that sort of pressure starts coming in emotionally, that's when I, I seem to turn to art for some reason. Art became sort of a refuge or an ex a way to express what was going on right, inside me. Right. And that's when my life took a very definite turn away from science and towards art. Like a perfect example was I was at an impasse between becoming a programmer or becoming an artist. I could right. have been either one. I had potential in both. I was horrible at both really by the standards of a professional, but by the standards of a high schooler. I was showing really good promise in sure. both directions, and I turned towards art because it had what I needed at that time, and that was to express myself. I needed to get some stuff out. You got something out of it, for yeah. sure. And yeah, some satisfaction. or. But, but, but being originally a scientist, I feel like it's held me back as an artist because I don't have that free-flowing spirit of a true, what I would call a true artist, like as a person. A true artistic person seems to be a little wild, almost like a wild horse that you can't tame. Right, and, and they sort of flow with the rhythm of the universe, and they, they aren't restricted by technique or. It's almost like what you're saying is, uh, I think I'm a lot like you in a sense where I, I grew up, you know, with the same fascinations. I mean, I, I collected books on locomotives, old lo locomotive trains, uh, dinosaurs. I have mass. I still have an obsession with dinosaurs. I have fossils. I have, you know, um, uh, you know, models of skulls and things like that in my studio. Um, and I grew up on a farm, so I was always catching snakes and frogs and, and frog eggs and, and, and putting them in aquariums and watching them hatch and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So. Um, but I think what you're, what you're saying is like, I mean, I think there's a whole spectrum of individuals, and I think that there are some who you could say, this guy is a total artist through and through. He's eccentric. He has total free will, total freedom. 
doesn't care about possibly rules that society sets out for them, doesn't care about um, how they look. All they care about is expressing themselves through a medium. And that's all they wrap themselves up in. And yes, they could be technically good at something, you know, either be playing piano really well or, you know, really good at achieving reality with paint and techniques. But um, I think those people are on the extreme left side of the brain, you know. Uh, I, I think people who are wild artists, like the wild horses you're talking about, are the ones that definitely get noticed more often because of they're eccentric and they're yeah, because they're glorious bastards. They're glorious bastards, <laughs> and that that that's interesting as well. Uh, I think those are the noble ones because they're the ones who are definitely they have no inhibitions. They're just they're just they're free spirit, mm. and and I like to know what makes them that that way. Yeah, there's definitely an admiration from me for that kind of person, uh, just being that free and uh, extremely human in that way, at yeah. least when it comes to the soul of a human being. And then you've got the opposite side of that coin, which is the scientist who becomes so robotic and cold about everything that they can't even dream about any idea. And those become the scientists that sort of become machines in a corporation somewhere, just running test facilities and not maybe, really achieving maybe. anything, right? Yeah. Like, it seems that to be successful in science, to be a real shining star of science, you need to be part artist. And I wonder, possibly to be a shining star in art, do you also have to be part scientist? Do you have to... It, th is the extreme so. a good thing always, or I is think, it best to have a balance? I think the other thing that I failed to mention earlier was that... Um, I always found that scientists and artists shared uh, a similar level of curiosity mm. in, the, in, in the reality. You know, um, I think that's why we ask so many questions. Um, I'm, I'm always asking myself about reality and um, what's the purpose of life and um, uh, what, is my, what is my role in society. And, and, I mean, I'm a father, I have kids, I have a wife, I, I live a pretty pretty typical suburban existence, but I think there's this unique side of me where I'm always falling into uh, art and music and, you know, drawing illustrations, and uh, um, I find illustrations are interesting because you're taking something from a written word and you're reinterpreting it visually, and it, it can take on its own form. Of, like, I'm not defining something that I see, but I'm defining something that I read through sim symbology, and I think it's interesting. Like I think, I think both sides share a common ground. That it's 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 about wonder. It's about being curious about w what's around you. And I think if you have a higher sense of, of curiosity, um, you're going to pay attention to things around you more than say anyone who isn't as curious. And they just they just exist. They're mm -hmm. just there. I think we have. Um, I think it's it's a luxury, but at the same time, I think it can be a curse at times too, because uh, you know we tend to get wrapped up in things that maybe don't matter to most people. But um, I think there's a place for us, though. I mean, obviously, uh, art and communication play a critical role. Science plays a critical role in maintaining the health and and uh, sustenance of society, whether that's a good or a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. There's a place for I think. Every one of us, every type of personality out there does belong in society, but uh, many types are less embraced than others. And certainly I think in today's society, science is overly embraced and art is somewhat left out in the cold, at least by governments and funding and priorities. Yeah. Right? How do you think in our country right now, what do you think the state of art is overall? What's your read on that? Oh, in this country? Yeah, let's just say in Canada specifically. Or like you could say in the whole world, if it's all the same. <laughs> I don't know. That's a really tough one because um, there was a time that a piece of art could be released into the world and it would cause a revolution. Yeah. Because um, society had, there was more of a mind control grip on, on people. I think now that there's technology where people are communicating between each other a lot more readily and a lot more easily uh, with less effort. I think we can share ideas a lot more. I think people are directly um, 
not allowing themselves to be controlled by media as much anymore. I think people see through government uh, government activity and, and um, I mean, it's tricky to say because, like, there's good people out there and there's not so good people out there. And I think people are just realizing that the world is a lot more transparent, uh, especially with social media. I mean, everybody's expressing how they feel and what they ate 15 minutes ago. Um, and it's a frightening thing at the same time because, you know, uh, I don't know if anything is as sacred as it used to be. But um, I think there was a time when people were a lot more closed in and like the 60s and 50s, for example, and there was certain social attitude, you know, I, whether it be good, good attitudes or bad attitudes towards things like religion, race, uh, how we should conduct ourselves. And I mean, there was, there was books on rules of etiquette and things like that. You know, there's a lot more, a lot more control and, and this pursuit of civilization and whatever that may be. You have to follow these rules to be normal or to, you know, um, to function in a prosperous way in society. And art played an important role that said, no, you don't have to be all these things. You don't have to fit within this box. You could be whatever you want and be beautiful at the same time and be, be valuable. Yeah. Um, so I think art played more of a liberal role in even in music. You know, art to me is music and, and visual. It's something that delivers an idea. And I think that um, art plays a massive role in society. Um, I don't see it having so much contrast as I don't. I don't see anything anymore having as much contrast as it may have back in the day. Because, you know, I think everything has become so diluted. Everybody is so open-minded these days. Everybody's interested in all these things. Like, look at hipsters, for example. What is a hipster? A hipster is like pseudo-intelligent book reader. Uh, almost has a scientific mind, uh, but very eccentric and, art, art, you know, like, it's like a oh, fusion. It's like, crap, I think I'm a hipster. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, you have this fusion of, of definition. And I think even in music now, you've got hip hop artists doing songs where they have fused in rock and roll and they have rave elements in there now. And it's, everything is just kind of conforming into this chaotic hmm. mixture of things like this mashup. And you're sort of describing a dying out of originality then. I feel that Possibly. in movies and many artistic industries, originality is at an all-time low, at least in my lifetime. And, Maybe and that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. I wonder if that has anything to do with revolution, because the last explosion of art that I can think of was the late 60s and the 70s, yeah. right? And that was a great time of revolution. It was also a time uh, where you had drugs come into the culture in a very heavy way. And I wonder, are those two ingredients that you need to have real stimulated art? Like, the, the only, uh, the nearest thing I can think about in recent times as a revolutionary artist, at least in popular media, would be Lady Gaga. And she wasn't really that revolutionary. She was just outrageous and, and, and different, yeah. right? So that was cool. It was refreshing in a way to have a character dress herself and behave this way in public. That was a spectacle. But was it revolutionary? Uh, was she calling for any sort of revolution? Not really. I think the only revolution someone like Lady Gaga represents is individuality and not being afraid to um, just be who you, you're meant to be or who your gut tells you to be. Um, I think what's remarkable about her is when she first came on the scene, uh, her music was very typical. It was all sexual, and it was all hip-hop beats and, and uh, you know, Poker Face is the first thing I, I think I recall from her. And if you listen to the lyrics of Poker Face, it's really heavy sex, you know. But I think what makes her remarkable is uh, she is who she is. She doesn't care what anyone thinks, but she also has a talent to back it up, and I, I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So she's one of those maybe well-rounded artists where... She biases visually on the eccentric, and she acts kind of out there, and she puts on this, this persona. Um, but she definitely has the left side of the brain going for her, where she, she can play technical piano better than most people I've ever seen. Like, mm -hmm. she's up there with Prince, in my opinion, in terms of technical execution and talent. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if really what she represents has a lot of depth. I don't see her really being as important as someone like John Lennon. 
John Lennon was more about, uh, and I found him very innocent. I found him just being, you know, expressing what he thinks based on what he feels is ideal. And then directly or not, he was kind of calling for revolution. And he was directly calling or for not, the downfall yeah. of the man. And well, and he changed, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of people base their lives around the word of John Lennon, you mm-hmm. know, um, which is a very dangerous thing in society. And I kind of wonder, not to get into conspiracy, if he was possibly executed for that reason. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Because, you know, at that time, there was still a lot of uh, regimental society, you know, you need to be this, you need to be corporate, you need to be this, you know, you need to be in a box. Mm. And here comes this guy from England who pretty much had extreme success with the Beatles and just was like, I'm just going to say, say it like it is. And, uh, and everyone, a lot of people got turned on to his outlook and realized that, wow, Imagine was about abandoning religion and, and preconceived notions of how you're supposed to process everything around us. And uh, what a wonderful world it, it could be if we didn't have these things that define our conflicts between each other, which was a beautiful thing. I wonder if a man like him, if he had come along in a time of less tension in society, if he would have been appreciated at all. Is it that he came about in such a tumultuous time? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But I think, like you, like I think that it's interesting because I don't know if you notice in this country as well that there's as much deception and cheating and and. There's a lot of facets in society that are taking advantage of everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, But everyone is just so chill that you never see anyone walking the streets or having riots um, about, say, what Harper might be doing or or what McGinty did. Or um, I had an interesting conversation with my dad, who is from Ireland, and and, uh, he said, you know, if any of these things happened in, in... Ireland or Paris or anywhere in France, you know, anywhere else, there'd be cars on fire turned over up on their backsides on the streets and there'd be these passionate riots, but you don't get that here. It's a very passive society. We are a remarkably placid people, only eclipsed by the placid Americans. And I only say that because actually I think we are more placid, but they are they have even more reason to have a revolution. They have constantly news stories that each individually are worth burning down some sort of government building, not that I advocate that, no. but there's some of these stories where you're like, they're doing what now, and why is no one in the street? Yeah. In Canada, yes, there's bullshit, but the bullshit in the U.S. eclipses anything in Canada, and, and it, oh, yeah, it's amazing to me that these people that tend to be uh, uproarious and, 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 and even violent with the gun culture and everything they seem to just let it all slide. It's very strange today how populations all over the world, or at least in North America, seem so indifferent to what's happening. And I wonder if part of that is because there are no true revolutionary artists um, putting a message out there. Maybe that's the role. Maybe that's the role that they did so well in the back then was polarize I, I the injustice in something or the justice in something. I mean, it's not all about you know, expressing what's not right either. It's it's also about celebrating what's what is right. I think um, I think you're right. But um, there's no polarization of expression anymore. There's no uh, there's no mechanism of of bringing out issues. I think the real way. I think I think the great purpose of art in society, if you look at all of these sectors, art, science, etc., as organs of society, the function of the organ that is art, I think more than to please the eye or more than stimulating people's hearts, I think the main function of it is to offset the power of institution and and overly caging the citizen. Art seems to be the other force, the force for freedom and the call to release, let my people go, right? Yeah. And I I think that's more on on how we control ourselves. Are you going to allow yourself to live in fear of well, I can't do that because, you know, I'm going to be shamed. Or is it, a, is it, is it, a, is it about, you know, just, just liberating yourself mentally and, and, and how you think and, and what you appreciate and not being afraid to appreciate things that might be unusual or whatever. I think art is a visual symbol of, of being fearless, of being, being free. You know, I think it's all about freedom in the end is what art, 
art represents to me. That's beautiful because I was arriving at the same conclusion as you, as you were saying it. We talked earlier about artists and scientists being similar in the pursuit of beauty, but then where, they're dif where they differ, I think, is this deeper purpose, this deeper force behind them. The artist is a force for freedom. Yeah. And the scientist is a force for knowledge. Yes. And possibly even control. But I think we finally arrived at the core of what an artist is. It's, it's, it's the spirit of freedom. Cool. And that makes you wonder if people create art without that spirit, are they wasting their time? No, that, that's a profound question there. Mm. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> we pursue anything for our own agenda, really. Oh, I don't know. That's interesting. Like, if you look at punk music, for example, punk music's about anarchy and, and breaking those chains of what's expected. And, and I mean, they're artists in their own right, you know, mm. spiking their hair and ripping their clothes apart and looking visibly just chaotic and crazy. But the message in a lot of punk music is, is about don't do what the fascists say and, and fuck everyone and do what you want. Um, but I think that's fine too, but you also have to be considered to some degree and you know, you can't just say fuck it and do whatever you want. As long you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't harm anyone, I think. I think that's where we need to find that balance in anything we pursue in life. But uh, it's interesting. I think I think we might be onto something there. Yeah. I think in light of this conversation we can say without self centeredness as artists, I think we can say that our society would be a lot poorer without artists and things would be a lot different if artists didn't exist. Yeah, and, and I think uh, we've always have existed. Yeah, of course. You know, either in the form of uh, being a storyteller. Right. Or in the form of, you know, um, planning a hunt mm -hmm. and illustrating almost right. like a sequential comic book on the walls of the cave. Or draw, drawing in the sands. And planning. Right. You know, uh, our art has a very mechanical function in that regard as well. But uh, it's the freedom of ideas. It's the freedom of, of imagination. It, it, it's it's a vehicle for for us to allow what we tend to let our minds drift into have a stage. That that's pretty exciting stuff. And so, any attempt by a government or an institution like a school system to reduce art, to defund art, to eliminate art, is actually then an affront to humanity. It's then an attack on one of the very most important and basic fundamental parts of humanity, wouldn't you say? I would agree with that. Uh, I, would, I would dare say that it's, it's a devalue of what the purpose of being artistic is for society. I think if you close the gate on that, I think it, it limits the possibilities of, you know, amazing expression you could have in, in the future. Could it even be an architecture, you know? Uh, the thing I love about revolutionary artists, and even architects, is that, um, again, they're not afraid to put something across the landscape of our reality that jumps out at us and makes us think and go, wow, well, that's interesting. You know, what, what, is, what does that mean? You know, why, why is that building so spiky and so, you know, uh, asymmetric? And, but it looks, it looks amazing. There's so much energy in what I'm looking at. You know, um, I think art's meant to inspire, and I think that... Um, and it's, I think limiting the inspiration of change is not a good thing for human progression and, um, in society. So I think that limiting the funding for our programs is an attack on, on that possibility. I don't know if it's an innocent thing where you have organizations that just don't understand its function or its role, or maybe you do. I, I don't know if it's that deliberate, but uh, it is frightening. It's a frightening reality for sure. My gut says it is deliberate because art is fundamentally opposed to um, institution, as I said earlier, and governments and school systems being institutions. Naturally, they feel the threat of this anti-institutional thing, and so they would naturally defund it before they would defund science or English or any other sort of piece of society. Um, it's, it's an indirect, it may be subconscious, it may be unconscious, but I think that at least when it comes to government funding, it's a very conscious decision to try and stamp out the human spirit and try to yeah. eliminate that. But lucky for us, 
since art is fundamentally human, I don't think you can succeed in stamping no, out no. art I mean, unless you stamp out humanity. Like I said, it's always been there. Yeah, and, and it always any, will. Any configuration of, uh, of society and society's abilities. And I think that um, uh, maybe if you close off the uh, availability of, of uh, exposing art and, and encouraging art, Maybe something revolutionary is going to come out of it. And exactly. Or get back that uh, polarization that we've Art been liking. Art explodes when you try to cage it down. There you go, Let's brother. hope they keep trying because yeah. then we're going to have another 60s or 70s on our hands. You know. And I can't wait. Who knows, one of us might be the next Andy Warhol. So. Oh, God, let's hope so. <laughs> so, well, thank you, Irish, for joining me. No Do you have any message for any artists out there, maybe young artists listening, before we go? Oh, man, just, uh, just follow your instincts. Um, for all of those that don't fit in, who follow their instincts and are told they sin, this is a prayer for a different way. Well, Irish, my coworker, fellow artist, and dare I say, friends, thank you for taking my call today, and I hope you'll uh, join us again on the Higher Ideas podcast. Yeah, thank you. All and right. take care of yourselves. Till next time. So, what a very interesting conversation. Thank you to my friend Irish for joining me, and thank you guys for listening in to this latest episode of Higher Ideas. And don't forget to sign up on Twitter, YouTube, on iTunes, and just check out the website at higherideas.net for an easy way to keep track of new developments. And look forward to other episodes like this very soon, because I am now on a new mission this year. I'm on a mission to not only tell you what I think about the universe from my personal room, in my private time, but I'm about to go out the door and start meeting the universe, and I'm taking you with me. So that's it for this time. Until next time, keep thinking.